Pliosaurs are the quintessential prehistoric sea monster. Massively built, powerful swimmers with skulls the size of boats and teeth that could double as railroad spikes. While most of us were introduced to this group of marine reptiles by the fictionalized walking with dinosaurs Lyplerodon, a 150-ton, 25-meter behemoth that turned out to be based on a sauropod vertebra, Pliosaurs have gained more traction in popular media based on their own merits. This video examines the Megapliosaurs, those giants among the giants, the Pliosaur species whose maximum body mass matches or exceeds 5,000 kilograms. We're dividing these critters into tiers based on their mass. First is the gunboat tier, for the 5,000 to 10,000 kilogram gang. Next is the ironclad tier, for animals between 10,000 and 15,000 kilograms. The last tier is the battleship tier, for those few supergiants 15,000 kilograms and above. Each pliosaur will also receive a Brunhilde score, or how many large female great white sharks it takes to match their prodigious body mass. Brunhilde weighs 1,100 kilograms. Not the largest great white by any stretch, but we have to remember that we're likely not working with pliosaur specimens that were anywhere near the maximum of their respective species either. Let's get started. These big-headed predators trace their distinct ancestry back to the Middle Triassic with the Pachypleurosaurs, a group that split into Nothosaurs and Plesiosaurs towards the end of the Triassic, while whale-sized Ichthyosaurs dominated the oceans. The end Triassic extinction wiped the Nothosaurs out, but Plesiosaurs survived and then spawned the prizefighter Pliosaur line in the Jurassic. They coexisted all the way to the end of the Cretaceous. It is possible that these represent morphotypes and aren't actually distinct clades, with some plesiosaurs simply evolving short, stocky builds and some pliosaurs stretching out, but barring an in-depth examination of pliosauroidea being polyphyletic, we'll assume that they're legitimate clade, now that you've heard the disclaimer. Morphologically, the pliosaurs are typically recognized by their massive long heads and short tails, and also have shorter necks than their plesiosaur relatives. They're appendicular swimmers, which means the majority of their forward motion is derived from their limbs rather than their tail or spinal column like in marine mammals. This ends up resembling underwater flight, with flippers moving like pairs of wings. The Princeton Guide to Marine Reptiles indicates that swimming at slow speeds is four times more energetically efficient than flying, but is far less efficient at faster speeds due to greater drag. Pliosaurs, like all vertebrates, would have had a mixture of red aerobic muscles for long-term swimming power, and white anaerobic muscles for burst speed in ambushes or when escaping larger predators. Their flippers would have twisted as seen in turtles to generate thrust over lift, since the animals were buoyant. Pliosaurs didn't have to deal with having the long necks of plesiosaurs, and were likely much faster, given their more hydrodynamic shape. The front and back, or fore and aft, flippers were comparably developed, so all of them contributed to thrust. The question is, would they have flapped together or alternating? That likely changed depending on their environmental needs. The Princeton Field Guide to Marine Reptiles states that during slow swimming, fully alternating fore-aft flipper flapping would have had the disadvantage of pitching the trunk strongly up and then down with each opposing stroke of the front versus aft flipper. But at high speed, such motion would be suppressed by the smoothing power of the water streaming fast around the trunk and rendering it more stable. Carpenter et al. 2010 demonstrated that a slight asynchrony was the most efficient way of swimming. This would have decreased the energy required for thrust and predation while maximizing speed. Speaking of energy, plesiosaurs, including pliosaurs, were likely endothermic according to histological analyses. Their high metabolic rate, high growth rate, and high long-term activity were found to be comparable to birds in a groundbreaking 2018 study, the first to quantitatively analyze the histology of these underwater superpredators. To further counter the stereotype of marine reptiles as dull, sluggish, lizard-like animals, not that lizards are dull or sluggish to begin with, many plesiosaurs have been found to give live birth, also known as viviparity. This polycotylid plesiosaur is admittedly derived, so may not share as many characteristics with pliosaurs, but was found with a single very large fetus. This indicates that at least polycotylids gave live birth and focused their resources on one well-developed youngster at a time, similar to whales. The idea of parental care on that level in such traditionally terrifying reptilian sea creatures is pretty dang fascinating if you ask me, and I can't wait for further studies on the subject. One more cool fact before we get started on the tears. A recent study found salt glands in ichthyosaurs, and given their similar lifestyles, pliosaurs likely possess them as well. If you have jaws the size of a pickup truck, you're going to be intaking a lot of seawater, and you'll need some way to process it. Just thought that was neat. 
Oh, and we can't forget the honorable mentions. These pliosaurs didn't quite make the five-ton cutoff, but are too charismatic and culturally impactful not to at least make a cameo, like Pleurodon Ferox. The mighty may have fallen, but this six and a half meter predator is still a force to be reckoned with. The 2900 kilogram animal had a skull that could easily bite a human in half without thinking about it, and its asynchronous style of swimming with four flippers would give Michael Phelps a panic attack. At least until it caught up to him and swallowed him whole. Known from Europe and Mexico, Lyplurodon is the starter Pokemon of Pliosaurs for the majority of paleontology nerds and deserves this shoutout. Luscon Italensis, another honorable mention, switches up the script by being adapted for hunting smaller, soft-bodied prey with its long jaws and small teeth, as opposed to Lyplurodon's hefty, robust morphology. It's a relatively recent addition to the Pliosaur family as well, since it was only discovered in 2017. Luscon's name means Water Spirit Chief of the Volga River in a combination of Mongolian and Turkic, so that's dang cool. It would have feasted on fish and cephalopods, but given its sheer size could have easily taken on human-sized prey if it chose to. Our last honorable mention is Pliosaurus carpenteri, a behemoth from England's late Jurassic. P. carpenteri was described in 2013 and is very similar to Pliosaurus westburiensis, with an earlier study lumping them into the same species. P. carpenteri is far from the biggest species within the Pliosaurus genus, so keep an eye out for more as we move on to the actual Megapliosaurus. The Gunboat Deer Megacephalosaurus lived around 94 to 93 million years ago and absolutely terrorized the western interior seaway during Lake Cretaceous. This aptly named giant-headed predator weighed over 6 metric tons, comparable to bull African bush elephants, and dominated an environment filled with large sharks and other predatory fish like Savactinus. It's crazy to me that we don't talk about pliosaurs more often, given how long they lasted in the Mesozoic and how terrifyingly huge they got specifically in the Cretaceous. Maybe this video will start some conversations. Who knows? Stenorhynchosaurus munozai is known from two specimens, an adult and juvenile, both from Colombia. The adult is huge, at 8.5 meters long, and likely weighed around 7 metric tons. Ammonites were actually found inside of the skull of the holotype, indicating a depositional environment that allowed for dying invertebrates to sink and fall inside of the giant predator's carcass. Finding the remains of huge super predators is awesome enough, but when the fossils allow you to recreate the scene of its death and burial, it's even better. The Ironclad Tier Holy crap, we're already in the Ironclad Tier? I'm used to working with theropods, so already passing the 8 and 9 ton marks is wild. Stop it, Ocean, you're making Tyrannosaur fanboys like me feel bad. Well, anyway, I promised you that we hadn't seen the last of Pliosaurus, and here's Pliosaurus rossicus to take our tier list to the next level. P. rossicus, as the name implies, was discovered in Russia. And wow, is it a monster. At 9.6 meters long and 10 metric tons, adult P. rossicus was one of the late Jurassic's most horrifyingly cool creations. For perspective, it was nearly half the length of a Norse Carvey longship, and absolutely would have been recognized as a sea monster by the ship's Viking oarsmen. They'd tell stories of the ocean dragon, spawn of Jormungandr, that swam past them, of its jaws the size of a man and teeth as large as daggers. Hmm, this is giving me more ideas for extinction. Megalnusaurus rex means king of the swimming lizards. While we will see that it isn't quite true, since there are multiple animals notably larger on the list, it's still quite a formidable creature, at nearly 10 meters and 11 tons. Named in 1898, it's one of the oldest pliosaurs in the scientific record, and this species is known only from one specimen found in Wyoming. More material from Alaska has been referred to the genus level. We don't have any material from the skull, so any inferences about its specific ecology or skull proportions are entirely guesswork. Still, the material we do have is massive, and definitely worthy of inclusion on this Mega Pliosaur tier list. If you thought Pliosaurus rossicus was big, you were right, but that doesn't stop this referred Pliosaurus cavani specimen from being even bigger. It's a nearly complete postcranial skeleton, but funnily enough isn't confidently assigned to a particular species since Pliosaur postcrania are relatively rare. The little bit of skull material we do have seems to overlap with P. Kevani, hence the referral, but this is absolutely subject to change in the future. Don't be surprised if it ends up being re-described as its own genus in the future with a name like Thalassodominus or something similarly edgy. If it does split from Pliosaurus, I would want it to get a cool name. This specimen is gigantic after all, and should be honored with a title befitting its ironclad rank. Monkirosaurus boyacensis is from the Paja Formation an area in Colombia that you will soon appreciate more than ever. 
Stenorhynchosaurus was also from the Paha Formation, along with another titan that we'll discuss in a minute. This area of early Cretaceous Colombia was doing something crazy to produce so many megapliosaurs in the same spot, and personally, I'd love to visit. Moncurosaurus in particular was also called Chronosaurus for decades, since the holotype wasn't available for researchers to go and study. But in 2021, a team was able to examine it in person and classify it as its own genus. Even while incomplete, the holotype is 7.5 meters long. It's not as long as the Pliosaurus cavani we just discussed, but appears to be proportionally more robust, placing it at the same overall mass. And just a reminder, for those who need it, these estimates are all estimates, and are subject to fluctuation based on measurement standards and methodologies. A good meal would add a few hundred kilos to any one of these critters. The monster of Arimberi is, in fact, quite monstrous, but is also responsible for much of the misinformation floating around the internet regarding giant pliosaurs. It appears to have played a role in the inflation of the walking dinosaurs Lyplerodon, for one. Don't get me wrong, this creature is gigantic, at nearly 11 meters long and 14 tons. That not only dwarfs the biggest great white sharks by an unreasonable degree, but it's also a third larger than the biggest orca ever recorded. I am in no way suggesting that this is not an impressive specimen. Quite the opposite. I just want to address the idea of some 100 plus ton super pliosaur and hopefully exterminate it. Some pliosaur glazers have gotten it in their heads that the pathologies on the monster of Arenberry's skull, while possibly indicative of a bigger animal attacking it, somehow definitively signify a pliosaur the size of a blue whale based on how deep the puncture marks are. As Adam Smith put it, we don't actually know if the pathologies on the skull were bite marks to begin with, the angle if they were bites is uncertain, and post-traumatic taphonomy and bone reaction can also warp the shape of wounds. I would not consider this reliable in any way. I want giant pliosaurs as badly as any reasonable paleoenthusiast, but let's focus on the giant pliosaurs we actually have evidence for. There's quite a lot, as you've already seen, but we've got more to cover. On to the final class, the battleship tier, the elite of the elite when it comes to pliosaurs. Chronosaurus queenslandicus lived in early Cretaceous Australia and ruled the Aramanga Sea. It was described nearly a century ago, and as such is one of the most well-studied pliosaur genera. Bite force estimates for the animal are around 30,000 newtons, comparable to the lower estimates for the smaller skulled Tyrannosaurus. Something about that seems a little off to me. I'd expect Chronosaurus to have a much stronger bite considering its skull was twice as long, but apparently finite element analysis shows a higher stress during biting than expected. More studies might have to be done to satisfy my uncertainties, however, because that just seems way too low. I suppose it's a lot less robust than a T-Rex skull, so that might explain it. Anyway, Chronosaurus is awesome. All of its nightmare-inducing teeth are different shapes, or an isodont, with straight stabbing teeth at the front of the jaws while its rear teeth are curved for gripping and holding prey. It wouldn't be fun for any fish, turtles, or other marine animals that were trapped in those jaws, unless their name is Zeus. Even then, Zeus tricked Kronos into eating a rock instead of him, so maybe not the best comparison. The Paha Formation has done it again! Sachikosaurus vitae is another absolutely enormous pliosaur from Colombia, at a stunning 15 tons. It's 9.9 meters long while incomplete, and was also a subadult based on the degree of fusion of its vertebrae. It's one of the most complete pliosaurs ever discovered, which combined with its size makes me wonder why it's received so little media attention since its description in 2018. I guess that's up to me to fix, along with anyone watching this who likes pliosaurs and has any kind of platform. A random cool fact about Sachikosaurus, it was found in a gypsum mine that had been abandoned for three decades. That is a certified Minecraft moment right there. Most of us have heard of the infamous Predator X. I'm happy to report that this is a case where a sensationalized media darling fossil does in fact turn out to be gigantic, at over 11 meters and 16 tons. This Nordic pliosaur wasn't just huge either, but likely quite a fast swimmer. Its fins were longer in proportion to its body than other megapliosaurs, enabling it to slice through the water with panic-inducing speed. It was a robust animal and is known from two specimens both thought to be fully grown adults. Thank goodness. Both specimens are currently at the University of Oslo, so if you're in the neighborhood, go take a peek and a few pictures. I'm sure it's a lovely experience. The United Kingdom once again displays that it's the top dog when it comes to predatory marine reptiles. Not only do they get to brag about the Rutland Sea Dragon, Ichthyotitan, and the Oust Colossus, which is probably just a really big Ichthyotitan, they also have the biggest pliosaur ever discovered. 
This specimen, whose Chaos God spawned catalog number inspired the nickname Archeon, is referred to Pliosaurus, but not to any particular species. The material consists of four cervical vertebrae, which can make direct comparison with other Pliosaurs difficult, but oh boy are they huge. Based on other large-bodied Pliosaurs, Archeon would have been over 12 meters long and weighed a whopping 20 tons, twice the mass of the biggest orca ever recorded. This animal, Archeon the ever-chosen Pliosaur of the End Times, may have been the biggest predator of the Jurassic or the Cretaceous that we know of during this video's writing, of course. Tyrannosaurus rex on land maxed out between 12 and 13 tons, using the biggest known specimen, Goliath, while the biggest mosasaurs seem to have peaked at around 10 tons. Archeon doubled that. Even the big Jurassic ichthyosaurs don't seem to have hit 20 tons. Now, keep in mind that neck proportions varied between pliosaurs. The estimate provided here is right in the middle, assuming average proportions for the rest of the animal. They could be as low as 9.8 meters based on Stenorhynchosaurus, which would still be a 10.6 ton animal, or as high as 14.4 meters based on Lyplurodon, which would get us a hulking 33.7 ton beast, scaling from random dinos 12.1 meter and 20 ton estimate. That very highest end, which I'm not going to swear by, would be almost the same size as the macro-predatory ichthyosaur Himalayasaurus from the late Jurassic Oceans that once covered Tibet. Get out of here, ichthyosaurus, stop flexing! This is a pliosaur video, they need this. Marine reptiles in general were amazing creatures, and I'm sad that we have so few left today. But maybe it's a good thing, at least for beach tourism. It would be a bit of a downer if a Kronosaurus appeared off the coast of Australia and started eating surfers. Great documentary material, though. There's an Ida Award for whatever plucky filmmaker gets that on camera with some talking heads. Thanks for diving into this analysis of the Megapliosaurs with me. I'm glad you enjoyed it and made it to the end of the video. I'd recommend that you subscribe, since if you watch this much of a hyper-niche paleontology video, you probably liked it enough to want to watch more videos like it. Good for you! I've got hundreds. Also, keep an eye out for my Paleo Fantasy series Extinction, which I teased earlier. It's an alternate history military fantasy, where warring civilizations like the Aztecs and Carthaginians use psychic bonds with prehistoric animals to battle on behalf of their gods. The first book, Obsidian Dawn, will be up for pre-order soon, and has a planned release for November 2025. If you'd like to support the channel, please consider becoming a member to gain loyalty badges and early access to videos. And comment below with your favorite Pliosaur. I'm the Vividen, and I'll see you next time.